Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is uh, a webinar called Climate Hope from the Dismal Science, how macroeconomic policy and water resilience can guide us towards prosperity. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, you uh, attending and uh, joining this webinar. It's very much a global audience. We hope to have it as a, a global discussion. My name is John Matthews. I'm the executive director for uh, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, AGWA and uh, uh, a member of a broad consortium of, uh, of governments, uh, finance institutions, of uh, NGOs and civil society uh, that are working together to try to translate uh, the concept of resilience into uh, the language of economics uh, and to think uh, about how uh, water is often a medium for conveying resilience across sectors across administrative boundaries, across borders. Uh, I, I'd like to start uh, by giving you a quick run of show. Uh, we're going to have an, an opening, uh, uh, a keynote from Michael van uh, van uh, Hineken, uh, the water envoy from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, then we'll have a, a brief introduction on water resilience as an economic concept uh, by Josefina Maestu, a, a, an overview of a report that's uh, coming out in about a week or 10 days uh, by uh, Ala Kokaila, uh, and the series of cases, uh, China, Australia, and Jordan, um, that exemplify some of the emerging patterns and trends, and then a panel discussion in which we invite you uh, to engage uh, 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 with uh, the speakers. Uh, we'll include uh, 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 WRI, the World Bank, uh, Wageningen uh, University, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, and uh, we'll see a lot come back uh, on the panel as well. I'm, I'm not going to mention all of our co-conveners, uh, but it's an impressive list. Uh, I, uh, the, uh, uh, the original idea uh, for uh, this work uh, really came from uh, a colleague who is uh, on, on, the, on the call, um, Niels Flandren uh, from, from the uh, Dutch Ministry for uh, Infrastructure and Water, uh, a, a longtime friend uh, and, uh, and a real thought leader in, in this space. Uh, and he and I uh, uh, began discussing this idea originally in the year 2000 with a, a close friend and colleague, um, Kees van der Hoek, uh, that we'd like to dedicate uh, this uh, session to him, um, who he passed away uh, 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 shortly after uh, we had our, our initial uh, meeting on 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 this topic, um, I'd like to uh, just as a as an introductory point, I I uh, ask you to uh, sign up. There's a link tree link right here uh, in the bottom left hand uh, part of your screen. In about a week or ten days, we're releasing a report that's called Enabling Resilient Res Resilient <clears throat> Economies. Uh, it's intended to be the start of a real conversation. Uh, 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 it uh, it describes some principles, some guidelines about how we can align resilience uh, and uh, economic uh, frameworks, uh, uh, tools and processes, uh, and how we can mobilize water as the instrument uh, for resilience more broadly. Uh, we also hope that you'll join uh, our LinkedIn group uh, on this topic. Uh, and that you'll uh, join uh, our network. Uh, we have a newsletter and so on. Um, but you can sign up uh, uh, at, at, that, at that link and we'll be displaying it later in the session as well. Lastly, I'd like to be able to introduce uh, Maika uh, van Henneken. Uh, she's the Special Envoy uh, for Water for the Kingdom of the Netherlands and Program Director for Climate Adaptation and International Water at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Uh, she has over 25 years of experience in the field of water, climate, energy, and food. We're really excited to have her as our keynote and uh, as someone uh, who's new in this role of special envoy uh, to really give voice uh, to these issues. The floor is yours, Micah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, John. And uh, very nice to see many old friends um, on the call. Uh, also very exciting to make uh, make new friends. Uh, I'm water envoy for the Netherlands uh, for only a few months, but I've been active in uh, in the water sector for many years and worked with many of you in different uh, capacities. 
uh, let me start uh, by talking a little bit about water and climate change. Um, mitigation, climate mitigation is CO2, climate adaptation is H2O. Um, people, and especially vulnerable communities, um, feel the impact of climate change through water. Uh, of course, through more erratic rainfall patterns, and in the end, rainfall is the source of all of our fresh water. Um, through drought, um, I always like to quote Richard Damania from the World Bank, who calls drought misery and slow motion. It's uh, not on the news, uh, but very deadly in many areas of the world, it causes hunger, but also causes loss of livelihood and, and other disasters. Just now, if we think about Horn of Africa, 20 million people are actually hungry because of extended drought in, um, in Eastern Africa, partly caused by, uh, by climate change. Of course, also through, uh, um, in, th through floods um, that we often do read in the newspaper, it's much more dramatic and immediate than drought. Uh, and also there uh, we see loss of life, loss of life uh, and, uh, and people being trapped in poverty because of floods. So if, um, if climate change manifests itself through water, we can also make water uh, the engine of climate adaptation. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're going to the COP with, uh, with three messages on this that I just would like to, uh, to briefly mention here. And the first one is that, of course, engineering and technology are important uh, parts of the solution. Uh, we see many things happening uh, from technologies for, for early, um, Early warning, early action. Think about uh, Bangladesh, where 20 years ago a typhoon would lead to up to 100,000 people dying. Well, now only a few dozen people die because there's early warning and early action. Um, drought resistance uh, seeds, um, new technology for coastal protection, flood protection, all very important. Uh, but we also believe that engineering and technology is not enough. Um, in order to adapt to cl changing climate, we need to do other things. And, and many of the solutions um, for water transition we need for climate adaptation are actually outside of uh, the water sector. Let me mention two. The first one is the protection and restoration of uh, freshwater uh, ecosystem, freshwater stocks. 99% of fresh water storage is in nature. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about large infrastructure, large dam. But the real water buffers we have are in our groundwater, in our surface water, and in green water um, in the zone uh, of the soil where water uh, is, uh, is being stored and reused uh, to, uh, by, by plants and by crops. Um, so we need to restore and, uh, and protect uh, groundwater resources, wetlands, floodplains, uh, and also make sure that farmers uh, use techniques to uh, protect soil moisture. And we know these techniques, um, they're technically feasible, but they need to be uh, used much more frequently and more consistently. So engineering and technology, making sure we protect our fresh water uh, stocks in nature. And the third thing is that we need to make water and soil guiding principles for spatial planning and economic development. Um, Around the world, we know that we cannot undertake all economic uh, activities in the future uh, everywhere. We need to make water availability, quantity and quality leading in what we do where uh, we cannot continue to grow thirsty crops like avocado and rice in the desert. We cannot continue to build cities um, in flood prone areas. Uh, we cannot continue to, uh, to grow our fat in areas with salt intrusion, or we need to change our cropping uh, patterns. And we also need to think where we put our industries, uh, given the risk profile um, of uh, climate change. So these are important actions. Uh, the underlying governance institutions and financing, of course, is also very important. In the Netherlands, uh, we've been fighting water for 800 years. Um, we're starting to change our culture around water and we're starting to work with nature against and uh, not against nature. Um, so we're doing some of the things I, uh, I just said. Um, room for the rivers, 25 years ago, we started giving uh, the, the floodplains of the rivers back to the rivers and storage capacity. 
uh, against floods. Uh, we are now also starting to protect some of our fresh water resources uh, to be a buffer against droughts or dry periods. Um, we think it's droughts in the Netherlands. I was in Egypt a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Minister of Water of Egypt said, uh, well, wait till you have a real drought, then we talk. Uh, but there is much more drier periods in temperate climates as well. And we need financing. We need a lot of financing, um, both domestic and international. Uh, and we also need to make sure there's proper uh, pricing, whether it's blue to pay or um, user pay principles. So a lot of work for economists uh, in this arena, in the arena of climate adaptation, climate resilience and water management that are all intrinsically linked. Um, very excited to be here because I must say that since I'm in this function, um, I uh, talk mainly to engineers um, and a lot of the discussions we have in the water sector do not go over uh, the borders of the sector and focus very much on uh, applying smart new technologies and, and doing more engineering, not always taking into account uh, the economic benefits and the economic costs uh, of this. So we need to quantify, measure and track resilience to inform decision making. Um, that's difficult. Um, climate mitigation with the uh, the tons of CO2 is something that everybody can reproduce what the measurements are. It's not always easy, but we have a clear measurement for resilience of a climate adaptation that's far less present. So we're even struggling with uh, physical indicators about water quality, water quantity, but we also need broader economic indicators and, 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 and social indicators. So really great that there's initiatives to look into this. Um, I also think that uh, looking at economic analysis to accelerate a mainstream water resilience is, uh, is very important. Uh, we need to ensure that we properly value uh, the robustness uh, and the flexibility needed uh, in times of climate change. Um, I was for 17 years in the World Bank and have been drilled, uh, even if I was a water engineer by, uh, uh, by training in how to do uh, economic uh, internal rates of return, how to do net present values, the very traditional economic tools. I still think that these are really important, but they're not sufficient uh, for a world in which uh, climate is changing. So how do we deal with the uncertainties? Um, because we don't really know uh, where the climate is going in, uh, in the future. So very excited to be here to see uh, the first draft um, of uh, the report uh, that's being uh, being launched at COP and to get a preview and, uh, and hear a preview of that from all of you. Uh, I think the dialogue between different professions, uh, between uh, engineers, economists, social scientists, ecologists, and name, name a few is important. Also the link uh, between all these technical professions and policymakers, um, I'm always amazed that uh, when I go to a water event, we all think that we have uh, convinced each other and we have the solutions, but then you go to a broader event, whether it's a climate event or a broader economic uh, event, and we actually don't speak the right language to convince decision makers to take climate adaptation and climate resilience uh, seriously. So I think in the past few years, Years together we have been successful in putting climate adaptation on the agenda and putting water resource management in the agenda and putting climate resilience on the agenda. It remains uh, a challenge to make sure that climate only are about climate mitigation but we also look at the adaptation and resilience part. Um, but we also now that we have a seat at the table actually need to be better at what we do what we say when we are at this uh, seat at the table and how we um, make uh, decisions to, uh, to have climate resilient solutions, but also solutions that are affordable and appropriate to the countries and the circumstances they're being uh, given in. Some of those are traditional engineering solutions where you can use pretty traditional economic analysis um, instruments. Others like spatial planning or like um, protection of, of, of ecosystems is even more difficult. What are the economic benefits? So I'm here to learn from you. Um, and I'm sure that together uh, with this group of very smart people and in the, in the coming weeks involving more people, we can bring um, the discussion forward, apply 
the various uh, concepts that we're discussing here and make sure that we, uh, we help the world towards a climate resilient uh, future. Thank you, John. Thank you, Val, Micah. Uh, that was a, a fantastic uh, intervention and you hit a lot of uh, really critical points. A uh, uh, couple of highlights uh, that I, I was uh, uh, really struck by, um, uh, really talking about water as a shared resource, one that spans uh, sectors that we need to make sure that we embrace as a, as a, as a shared resource, we don't treat it just as a narrow sector. Um, the idea of water as part of our natural capital and that there's a larger eco-hydrological landscape uh, that we need to be managing actively is, uh, is essential and critical. Uh, it's part of the way that we think about uh, resilience, perhaps in its broadest sense, that water comes from places and it's often interaction between climate and that landscape. Um, uh, how we count resilience, I think, is a, is a really critical and timely issue, especially uh, caught beginning in about two weeks. Uh, the GGA, the Global Goal and Adaptation, is an essential uh, topic of conversation for this year, for the COP, and probably for the coming year. Uh, the way that we, we keep score on resilience is, is going to be um, a, uh, a huge issue in how we define success and failure, how we define resilience in practice. Um, and uh, maybe uh, your last point, the, the idea that we need to make sure that uh, we're not communicating in silos, that we're actually trying to uh, bridge disciplinary uh, and topical uh, institutional boundaries, uh, that the economists uh, 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 need to be um, uh, thinking outside of their discipline. The water community needs to be engaging more broadly and learning more broadly, I would argue, um, as, as well. So uh, fantastic uh, points. I'd like to now turn uh, to uh, uh, my my uh, old friend uh, and colleague, uh, someone wh whom I have learned a great deal from, Josefina Maistu. Uh, she is an honorary professor at the University of Alcala. She has a background in economics and business administration, spatial planning and organizational theory, uh, has uh, held significant roles in Spanish environmental governance, uh, including advising on water strategy and policy. I met her when she was with UN Water. Um, she's had a, a long, a really dramatic uh, career. I think of her as the grand dame of, uh, of the water community um, and, and one who speaks with a, a lot of authority uh, uh, and credibility. The floor is yours, uh, Josefina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, it is my pleasure to be here. And, and uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, and congratulate the Netherlands for taking this initiative, because I think this is a groundbreaking initiative indeed. It's, it's creating a, a, a process uh, by which uh, we are talking differently about water, and we are trying to reach out to the economic community in a way that we haven't done before. Uh, the special envoy uh, of water already mentioned the kind of uh, economic impacts that, that uh, uh, water shocks and climate change is having on, on the economies. You know, by 2050, the World Bank is analyzed that uh, there are some regions in which water availability will be reduced by 20%, and this may mean between 6 and 7 and 10% of reduction of the GDP. Uh, re but it's not only in developing countries. A recent study from Harvard a project says that by 2071, nearly half of the 204 fresh water basins in the United States may not be able to meet their monthly water demands. In Spain, the projections by 2050 is that uh, we will have a reduction of, sorry, uh, by the end of the century, it, it predicts that we will have a reduction of our water availability in some regions by 40%. All this will have incredible economic consequences. So it's floods, it's droughts, droughts, but it's also water availability. So there are some uh, working definitions that I would like to, to bring to the table in terms of, of economic resilience. So resilience is the capacity of an economy to recover from crises like droughts and floods. Some countries uh, like uh, the special envoy has said, may be able to bring in finance to reduce the shocks that the, the, the economic problems that some of these shocks create, but some economies may not, and they will have a reduction of the GDP during a, a number of years. 
But what we are facing, facing is not only disturbances, that there may be longer disturbances, six years droughts, 10 year droughts, uh, more, much more extreme floods, but there are also structural changes in our climate. Uh, these changes are uh, permanent reduction of rainfall, the patterns of rain will change between winter and summer, etc. Temperatures are changing, and a resilient economy uh, needs to be able to adapt and transform itself to avoid these negative uh, medium and long-term socioeconomic and environmental consequences. Given that we don't know what is happening and there is a deep uncertainty of climate effects and, and what the, they will be their magnitude, a resilient economy would need to ensure that the economy works across a dynamic set of climate and not climate in the in consequences. And I argue that in, in countries where we have the limits of what the we have very high exploitation index. Our ability to respond is very, very low. So we have to build in resilience and uh, make sure that we that the climate change the structural changes are also accompanied by uh, economic changes. Um, in this initiative, uh, this consortium is basically working on two issues. One is how water availability and water risks are considered in the macroeconomic models that are used to guide national economic policies and plans. So make it we are talking about economics, <laughs> not engineering. And then the second question is how principles, tools, and practices, what you have done in the World Bank, of banks, insurance companies, and credit rating agencies consider water resilience at the time of making decisions. So those are the two major aspects we are looking in this initiative. The first one is about macroeconomic models. And now macroeconomic models and analysis develop short-term and medium-term predictions about the structural changes of the economy. They serve to analyze the impacts of specific macroeconomic policies and investments. And there are also general equilibrium models that analyze the direct and indirect effects of structural changes. But surprisingly, what we have looked at in this initiative so far is that most of these macroeconomic models, even in water scarce countries, assume a steady state of the environment. They rarely consider changes in weather conditions, water availability, or other changes. They, they are, or when they do, they assume that they will not have effect on the economy and they are constant through time. And I, I'm going to give you a little example, the Bank of Spain's annual reports, the quarterly report on macroeconomic projections of the Spanish economy of June 2023, or the financial stability report of spring 2023, do not take water into account as a determinant of the stability of the economy. And we are now in 2023 in a six year long drought. It has improved but uh, the, the, last, the last month, because there's been more rain, but there has been a six year drought and the Spanish macroeconomic projections are not considering the impact that drought can have. So they don't look at how it's affecting inflation, export competitiveness, uh, and how the waves and pollution may endanger some tourist des destinations, for example. So they, that's what we have seen so far. So basically in practice, uh, what we see is that by omitting the constraints that water resource may place on the economy in an environment of scarcity, deteriorating quality and climate change, it is explicitly assumed that water is an unlimited resource. That's what we are doing in economics. And does not influence the stability or functioning of the economy. Well, as I said, in some countries, this is very difficult to sustain. So, uh, the, you know, this is in macroeconomics. And in terms of the financial institutions, how they analyze programs and, pro and projects, the traditional economic analysis tools serve to evaluate programs and projects be and, and compare alternatives and optimize trade-offs. They maximize the net present values, the internal rate of return, or assess the outcomes through cost effectiveness and least cost analysis. These tools tell us if an investment is good for the economy or if a project is viable. But for the most, still implicit in these evaluation tools is that climate conditions will remain broadly similar in the time of analysis. And moreover, they discount the climate change effects uh, in time because they are going to happen in 10, 20, 50 years time. So they are not really built in into the analysis. Interesting, the credit rating agencies are waking up. 
I'm going to give you an example. No, the credit rating agency scope predicted that Spanish agriculture will lose 17.4 percent of its income between 2020 and 2050, the equivalent to 370,000 million euros as a result of lack of, rain, of rainfall and heat waves. This represents 4.8 percent of the GDP per capita over the same period. So the question is that if governments and microeconomic modelers are not considering uh, water, the financial system are going to tell us that is just something is happening. So the credit rating agencies are already saying that if governments use the public budgets to increase public spendings, then they would raise the debt to the GDP ratios, increasing risk, and then the cost of long-term refinancing. So it's through the, these financial institutions that government may also wake up and decide that there's, there is a need for improving the economic resilience uh, in, in face of the climate change and its impacts on water. Uh, another example uh, also is the, is the example that has to do with the financial stability related banks, for example. In, in, the, in the area of the Mar Menor of Spain, it has been, it has been uh, analyzed that we may be uh, losing residential value by 40%, 45% in six years. In the Netherlands, houses built on floodplains have loans, making any threat a risk for the lending institutions, and that will can 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 really have consequences uh, also to the to the economic system. And a very recent case that we have been seeing in the newspapers is the the collapse of the Suez Canal in 2021 that caused inflation to spike by two points in the U.S. during one year. So this type of uh, information, this type of analysis, and this type of messages. Through the through the economic and the financial institutions are the ones that we may need to have rea to react uh, by by economic decision makers and and help us uh, change and 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 uh, improve our water resilience for economic resilience. The the first response. Uh, perhaps by macroeconomic models or what is implicit in the macroeconomic models is that uh, the system can reach an equilibrium because of a spontaneous technology adaptation. We already uh, learned from Maker that this has potential, but it also has its limitations. Uh, that the water restrictions will lead to water reallocation to those more efficient users, but the, the, the reality is that water is a very heavily regulated uh, sector. There is no such a thing as a, as a free market, and uh, most of the decisions on water allocations are based on historical rights that do not respond to the market logic. The response uh, number two is to control uncertainty, and this is mainly in the analysis of projects and, and programs eh? by using, but what we are doing is using data from the past to understand the risk we face in the future, and we know this is not going to be possible to, to, to be done eh, in, the, in the long term. And the third response is the risking of projects. No, to to that has been an important advancement to to try that projects and programs can work under different circumstances. But this may be also me being not more not good enough. So when we are talking about moving towards water resilient economies, we hear some of the kind of solutions that we need to ad, uh, adopt, like adaptable pathways, diversification of resources. This is happening in Spain. We are we are investing in in. In desalination, in wastewater reuse, in trying to make sure that the, we have a portfolio of uh, of um, water resources that we can use uh, in different circumstances, also to invest in no regret options, nature based approaches, contingent water, water allocation rules. That's something that also happens in Spain, so that you can use water if there is water, you cannot use water if you don't. So there is no fixed water rights per se. So there are methods eh, for for preparing for many alternative futures and increase resilience. Many of these methods are characterized by redundancy. So we need to have more than one solution. That's expensive. Uh, robustness, so that they can be used in a range of multiple features. Flexibility to focus on co-benefits, the big word that is happening is coming over and over again. And there, these are all the qualities for resilience water and resilience uh, economies. But the the one of the my final thought here is that um, the question is how how to build this in economic decision making when the dominant paradigm is efficiency, you know. And the fact is that resilience may reduce resilience may, may reduce efficiency in the short run, but over the medium to long run, efficiency can can increase. 
as risk and progress and sustainability are enhanced. So if our economies uh, basically engage in a structural change in reduction of some uses and increase of other uses and, and have a lower exploitation of resources, it will be more efficient in the long and medium run. Okay, this is all from me. Thank you very much. Always oh, fantastic, uh, Josefina. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I love the idea of the uh, spontaneous, uh, unforeseen um, uh, adaptation solutions that uh, that appear mysteriously in in, in the future as the uh, kind of our archetype of uh, of uh, uh, economic optimism um, in, in in the context of adaptation. Um, I'm sure that uh, your uh, presentation will spark a lot of questions. I hope it's provocative for the uh for, for the panel uh, to come and uh and and um I, I expect that you will also get some questions uh, during that that period i'd like to turn now to uh, my uh, colleague and a uh, much newer friend ala kokaila she's an economist and sustainability expert with a decade of experience in government international uh, organizations and nonprofits currently a mason fellow at harvard's kennedy school She's led initiatives in environmental sustainability, empowerment, and financial inclusion, and served as an advisor to Egypt's Minister of, uh, uh, of International Cooperation. And I'm proud to say that she's an Agua Fellow as well. Um, the floor is yours, Allah. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today on our launch for our report. Um, and thank you, John, for this introduction. Um, I will just take you on a short journey to explain the report and our approach here and what we have done during the past year since the past COP and um, what's the objective. So as Josefina has um, explicitly emphasized, we cannot move to the future without with the same tools and the same methodologies, particularly when we're planning for economic development. Water. Um, Water is a stands in a pivotal intersection in the nexus of water and of environment, social and economic realms. It's the primary realm for climate change. And unfortunately, it for the past decade, almost 74 to 80 percent of the natural disasters were definitely water related. This have affected almost three billion people. When we look at water, water in economic models is usually undervalued because we don't have the proper tools to really evaluate more water. When we look at prices, there has been always a price paradox, and this have realized that water's valuation in economic models is really de-emphasized and devaluated. However, um, least, re most recently, the WWF have conducted some evaluations for the water for the water value, and they have estimated that almost the direct and the indirect benefits is fifty eight trillion. And this is allowed 60% of the global GDP. So this can tell you the importance of water in economics, in economic development, in every economic strategy and economic planning. And this can also tell us how the past economic models have failed us to plan for the future. When we look at finance and resilience, um, we are definitely in a very intricate point. Um, we Although global climate finance has been front and center for the past years, there have, countries have been um, giving on pledges and similarly international organizations. The amount of money that have been dedicated is not enough to already com compensate and solve the climate change program. What's more than that is that almost around three to five percent different estimates in different reports go to adaptation and mainly to developing nations. So here we are in a very difficult problem, and this is what we thought about, and this is how the whole report idea emerged, is how to have water in as a cohesive framework to promote for economic resilience. So if, oh, we have been always thinking of adaptation, and adaptation is how we can, the systems usually adapt and expand. But resilience is a byproduct of adaptation. It emerges as we have an expansive concept on expanding on the current capacity of social and economic and environmental systems. It allows us to have adaptive change, but it also allows us to be ready for any disruptive and any significant disruptions that takes place. The IPCC has defined it as the, as the ability for the system and its component parts 
the train was passing, I'm sorry. It's the ability for the system and the component parts to anticipate and absorb and accommodate as well as recover the effects of any hazardous, um, um, hazardous climate change. When we look at climate resilience as a public good, we know that it can be endogenous, which is technically as a small minimizing the effect and losses on productions, but it also needs to be dynamic, which is the ability to recover and rebuild. We need to think about what economic instruments that can be used in the context of adaptation that can help us through to, to make, mitigate effective risks and what types of models that can be amongst the society that we can implement that. So um, we reach out to our partners that have been implementing different successful cases. And um, we wanted to think about what have been the best practices that we do that. We know that we don't have proper economic models that efficiently evaluate water or integrated in their economic growth. But we also know we need to know, think about how can we prioritize water to become in, in, what, in economic planning? In other words, it's water centric resilience becomes a core function of how we think and we how we think about economic planning. We also need to renegotiate what water, its relationship with economic growth. And we also need to think of what types of financial instruments and what type of financial ecosystem and organizations. So we reframe the feasibility of the water and adaptation projects within these, these, these uh, organizations. We took the cases and these were technically the three modes we were thinking of. And um, uh, when when I take you deeper into, for instance, the first the first mode, which is prioritizing water centric resilience into economic planning, um, it's about having a um, comprehensive and nosed approach to overcome the upcoming period. One of the success models that we had was the Netherlands. So the Netherlands originally had a robust flood modding, flood management systems, but currently they are facing droughts. In 2018, they had a prolonged drought that its economic losses was around from 450 million to 40 billion. And they expect that the, the future to have more droughts. So they, um, the system and the government emer like, like brought in a new plan, which is called the Delta program. And the program re technically focused on emphasizing on the urgency of adopting water shortage. They talked with the industry and they started to implement seabed and promising ideas. And they reached a consensus that they need to build among existing organizations. And this is when we say water needs water, water centric resilience becomes a part of economic planning. It's not only a sector, it's a cross section across every organization of how they can think and adopt water to management tools into their implementation. We need we thought the second set of cases like Jordan, Spain, and Colombia, we were we were discussing, went more deeper into discuss the relationship of water when it comes to economic growth. Frameworks like privatization, pricing, and establishing property rights have previously overlooked the physical and the social attributes of the water supply and demand. And these needs to be re, re these needs to be revisited. When we look at economic growth, economic growth and water consumption, they generally have a positive correlation. Um, we know that the, the value of water, as I've discussed, is not properly valued. But because of this undervalue, and because water is always public good, we have realized that the markets reflect to reflect the value of water in economic models. And what was interesting here that, for instance, the case of Jordan that will be expressed more in the upcoming um, part of the, the like of the of the webinar, have brought in new tools in re in reassessing, in having proper data, and as well as introduced decoupling water from economic growth as one of the tools that can help us renegotiate and think the relationship between water and economic growth. As for our third mode that we have looked at cases like Afghanistan, South Africa, Australia, and Chile, we were thinking about what are the conventional tools and the economic tools that are currently needs are used and what are the few and how can we use reframe them for different water projects. 
We notice that de-risking, although it's currently used by a lot of financial institutions, is, is not enough. We need to think about how to look at cost benefit analysis that it incorporates resilience measures. We need to think of prolonged periods for financials, for financial, for, for these projects while we're looking at their financial analysis. So reframing financial feasibility using the past conventional tools part has failed us. And this can be very seen, can be seen why the private sector refuses to finance water projects. So if we need, we, if we are successful in shifting from conventional to resilience tools to incorporate these elements of risk, and we include natural capital accounting, I think we will focus, the shift will, our focus will shift from optimizing the short term needs and discounting our uncertainties to long term flexibilities and having these costs. And this is where we are really, again, emphasizing on how water can become the conducive element that promotes resilience. Finally, we have 13 case studies that have been all segregated across these thematic areas from all over the continent. And we have came up with seven modes of recommendations um, that similarly align with what we have gone, we have discussed, but also that can take us futuristically to how to implement water resilience and to drive economic resilience. Amongst the seven modes is thinking about cross-sectional planning when it comes to growth. We, it's how we identify risks when it comes to water-based water resilience and to have reliable outcome, outcomes. This includes stress testing, for instance. How, what are the strategies that we can have to diversify and plan for efficiency? How are the govern, what types of governance frameworks we need for policymakers that they can, can have systematic and transparent trade-offs and it's clear before them so that they can measure them and they can take the right decisions? Who are responsible for these governance frameworks? And what is the role of the frontliners, the NGOs, those to enable this transparency? We looked at some financial tools and incentives because this is very important to drive these projects. We thought about how cost benefit analysis, how de-risking, how discounting, and other tools. We also thought about how insurance and how the financial organizations can think of tailored financing for climate products, because we know for sure that the previous modes of financing will not work. We also understand that we need capacity building across different institutions and different sectors. And we believe that if we have a system of all these working together, when water is front and center on every national plan, we will be able to drive economic resilience. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot. That was uh, fantastic. I, I uh, really love the idea of resilience as a common good as well. Um, as so many uh, rich observations and examples. Um, we're going to go a little bit into more detail now in terms of the examples. We're going to start uh, with, uh, we're, we'll have three case studies. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, China and then we'll move uh, to Jordan and then, uh, or sorry, uh, Australia, and then we'll move to Jordan. Um, and I'd like to start off by uh, introducing uh, Tom Pinella. Uh, he's uh, uh, someone I've admired for a long time, um, well over a decade. He's the director for natural and capital uh, and, and climate, uh, Asia and the Pacific at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, he has over 30 years of international experience around water, energy and resource management. Uh, related to rural development and agriculture, uh, integrated resources management, finance, and infrastructure. Uh, he's served in many positions over the time that I've known him uh, at the ADB and uh, and always uh, been um, a, a great thinker and uh, uh, and someone who's uh, in, uh, deeply concerned about progressive, resilient economic development. Uh, the floor is yours, Tom. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. Um, so I want to talk about the Yellow River Basin, and I am going to um, use a PowerPoint. Um, so anyway, um, this is I, I want to call this a work in progress. Um, and uh, this talks about what's going on with the government of PRC, as well as some ADB support for the Yellow River Basin. And let me just give you a quick overview here. 
of um, the Yellow River Basin. So it is uh, the second largest basin in the, the PRC um, and uh, supports agriculture, uh, food production. It's really the grain basket of uh, the PRC, and um, but also heavily industrialized. And um, it supports about 25% of national GDP. So if we look at last year, that's about $4 trillion, which is a, a very big number. Yet it's uh, incredibly water scarce, 2% of the fresh water uh, with agriculture using the vast majority. Uh, here it has severe erosion problems, uh, Lewis Plateau, Yellow River, um, land degradation, grasslands, wetlands, all under pressure. Um, and climate change is front and center of what's going on uh, in challenging um, the uh, economic growth, uh, the social stability of the um, Yellow River Basin. And we see that both in drought and flood. I'll talk a little bit about that later. I think the important thing is, um, you know, it's a big basin. I'm not going to go into all the text here, but you, uh, if you're talking about economic resilience and water resilience, you're going to need um, bespoke integrated adaptation solutions because every part of a basin um, is different. And um, I, I think this is recognized, but uh, you know how you go about doing this um, is really also part of the challenge. So um, not only do you have uh, significant differences in your hydrology, um, you have uh, different uh, differences in your economic development. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the adaptation policy here in a bit, but in the PRC and ad addressing the Yellow River Basin, they're quite conscious of this and um, looking at uh, ensuring the integrity of the water system, yet at the same time, uh, ensuring green development in those areas that are less developed as well as addressing the challenges of water scarcity, water quality um, in the areas uh, that are more developed or perhaps uh, overdeveloped. And this all comes um, explicitly clear in um, both the National uh, Climate Change Adaptation Strategy in 2035 that was adopted last year. Um, uh, that uh, we provided some support for in the Yellow River Protection Law. And I just want to talk about the policy a little bit, um, the adaptation policy that, you know, in the opening um, portion of it, it, it says climate change has become an important non-traditional security factor threatening the construction of a beautiful and safe China. China has been severely affected both uh, in its traditional and non-traditional security, such as national economic security and people's life and safety, and brought various risks to China's modernization process and high quality development. So the, the National Adaptation Strategy and Protection Law just calls uh, climate change adaptation a national security threat, um, which I think is the way we need to think about it. Um, and in the, in the strategy it, itself, um, strengthening economic and social resilience to climate change is uh, a specific chapter that looks at agriculture and food security, um, health and public sanitation, infrastructure and major engineering projects, uh, urban and urbanized area, as we all know that uh, China is um, urbanizing rapidly and it even takes the climate dimension in terms of economic development on how, how does this uh, affect urban uh, rural migration patterns and what can be done to address that, as well as the, the financial sector. Um, so uh, I think the, the important part is we have this policy that lays out um, a comprehensive vision that then uh, they can use um, to downscale. And while there are many good policies in the PRC, I think that the challenge comes in um, downscaling these things. Now, the, the, also it's, I think, important to, to recognize that the, the Yellow River Basin is actually has its own section in the 
national uh, climate change adaptation policy. Um, and it's interesting the way they deal with it is it says the uh, Yellow River Basin, ecological protection and high quality development in the Yellow River Basin. So um, one of the solutions that they're looking at and they recognize and um, is protecting and enhancing the natural uh, uh, capital in the, uh, in the basin as a means uh, to address climate change uh, throughout the basin um, and to prioritize environmental protection um, and to create and consolidate the function of, ec of ecological barriers uh, to, to climate change. Um, and so I think uh, this is really uh, important ap approach. And um, I think it also highlights uh, what we're seeing uh, the kind of climate nature nexus coming to the forefront um, in a way that is often talked about um, as a, a, a threat or a, a, another uh, problem of climate change yet, you know, using NBS and, and enhancing our um, natural capital can also be a, a solution to this. And um, lastly, I just wanna talk about um, the, the other, priority for the Yellow River Basin in the national plan is to coordinate regional differences to prevent climate poverty. That's a section. So basically, um, poverty and in income levels as it relates uh, to basin development and climate change adaptation are an explicit consideration um, along with, with early warning and um, the other is to promote regional uh, cooperation and build a synergized governance system. Now, I think a lot of what I've said from uh, the policy resonates with um, the seven modes from the forthcoming publication. And, and I think um, I'll talk a, a little bit uh, here, and I know I'm running up against time. Uh, we are doing a, a climate change uh, adaptation plan for the basin. Uh, and I just want to talk uh, a little bit about that. Um, and I don't know why it's... Uh, and the other is the Yellow River Protection Law, which also specifically uh, talks about uh, climate change adaptation and um, ensuring economic stability. Um, some of the things that we're supporting the government on is, again, this uh, focus on natural capital uh, and climate and um, this uh, highlights the program that we're implementing with uh, the government and um, then the projects um, and our non-lending engagement through technical assistance would support all of these things. And I'll just mention that quickly. So um, some of the principles for engagement are a landscape approach, which I think is quite important if we're talking about adaptation that if you move to basin scale and it or sub basin uh, certainly gives you many more options uh, to look at how you um, ensure the uh, viability of your economic systems. Uh, institutional strengthening uh, is key um, and working both vertically and horizontally uh, across agencies. Um, technology uh, approaches. Um, and uh, working with PRC, we're fortunate um, that it's a very sophisticated client uh, that does have access to the latest technology and, and knows how to use it, and certainly knowledge and private sector engagement. And also, this is something that uh, I think is also quite important for um, how PRC is moving forward, is engaging private sector um, and private finance. Um, so a couple of things is one, this national climate change adaptation strategy um, provides uh, guidance um, for uh, downscaling to provincial and then basin level planning. Um, there are the Yellow River uh, Conservation uh, or Conservancy, uh, uh, the organization uh, responsible, the uh, 
YRCC, um, plan for guaranteeing water security through allocation as well as uh, water quality. Um, the Yellow River Protection Law that just came into effect um, last year, and again, we provided some technical assistance, but it also includes the Bohai Sea. So you see them uh, taking really a source to sea approach. Um, and, and again, climate runs uh, throughout this. Um, we talked about finance. Uh, PRC is also quite advanced in using ecological compensation um, systems, payment for ecosystem services. Now this is going on for um, water quality, but we're also working on different valuation tools uh, to help them to see how this might be applied for adaptation um, financing. And um, I'll just talk about Sichuan province uh, briefly. They um, are in the basin. Uh, there are provincial plans ongoing. Um, in 2022, I think uh, it's it's a very good uh, case that 85% uh, of the province gets, uh, or 85% of the energy is hydropower and it dropped uh, to like 45% of production. Um, chip manufacturers, uh, all the industry came to a grinding halt. And also hydro had been seen as uh, a, a very good solution to help China on its path to decarbonization. So with um, the climate change and the inability to adapt or the need to increase flexibility, you have a massive um, mitigation impacts coming from uh, the adaptation side of things when it comes to hydropower and the Sichuan province uh, plan on, on adaptation uh, looks at this uh, directly on, on how they can um, maintain economic growth. Uh, we're underway with this basin adaptation plan. I uh, hope to have more to report on that uh, in the near future. Um, and uh, just, again, we're taking a very comprehensive approach and the government is taking this also very seriously. Uh, putting billions of dollars into environment uh, and adaptation uh, related measures throughout the basin. But as noted, it's uh, a quarter of the GDP. Um, and lastly, I'll just, uh, if you can see this, um, this is the, the challenger up when, well, they talk about integrated uh, governance systems. Um, they recognize that climate change runs across all of these. And so I guess that, you know, the question is even with a very good framework, when you move to the policy and, and regulation level, and then the um, implementation, uh, you're dealing with uh, a very, very complex bureaucracy. Um, I think fortunately in PRC, you do have the leadership um, and the resources to, to uh, work in that direction, but but I think this you know initial idea of recognizing uh, adaptation as a as a major uh, security threat to the economy um, is uh, something that all of us need to do, and something that this uh, study is about. So hopefully, I'll have more to report uh, on specific measures as we move along, and I'll I'll end it there. Thanks, John. Thank you, Tom. That was excellent. Uh, and uh, I think you told a, a rich and complex story uh, there, and one that I think is uh, it shows the seriousness that PRC itself is taking these set of issues, but also how ADB is trying to look for strategic points of intervention to make sure that its investments and partnerships are actually able to leverage and reinforce your, your, your sense of, of uh, of, of resilience as an instrument of economic development more generally um, uh, uh, plays. I think that's uh, a, a profound and interesting story by itself. Uh, uh, my, my hunch is that we're going to see some maybe some questions uh, like that come up in the, the panel as well. Um, I'll turn now uh, to Australia. Uh, the, uh, we'll have a, a, a joint talk. Uh, it'll be led by Hugh Polner, he is uh, the Associate Director at Aether. Uh, 
uh, and uh, he's a has a, a specialization in water economics policy. Uh, I, Aether has uh, just gone through a large merger. They're a strategic consulting firm, um, and he has been working with uh, the Australian Water Partnership, who is a member of this larger uh, team. He, um, Hugh leads Aether's growing international advisory practice and has a background in geography and the environment. Um, his talk, because of the hour, is uh, is recorded. Hi, everyone. Sorry I can't join you live today due to time zones. As is customary in Australia, I'll begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people on whose lands I'm recording this presentation. My name is Hugh Polner. I'm an Associate Director at Aether, a specialist water economics policy and strategy consulting firm. My colleague Sarah Leck drafted the case study I'm presenting, and the work was generously funded by the Australian Water Partnership. Our case study focuses on Australia's Murray-Darling Basin. Many of you will be familiar with it. It's Australia's largest river system, crossing four states and one territory. Some other key statistics are shown here. Many of the most progressive and influential reforms to water resource planning and management in Australia have occurred in this basin. Over the past 30 to 40 years in particular, these reforms began to account for not just the financial costs and benefits of water use, but broader costs and benefits too. This meant maximising the economically efficient use of water while limiting environmental costs and impacts. These broader costs and benefits and the trade-offs with consumptive use of water were thrown into sharp relief during what became known as the Millennium Drought, which occurred in the early 2000s. Due to time constraints, I won't elaborate on the drought. Instead, let's turn to some of the policy changes that were implemented during and in the aftermath of the drought and consider their impact on economic resilience. Many reforms to water planning and management were implemented and incrementally progressed over the past 30 to 40 years in the basin. Given the focus of this initiative, let's look at just two examples today. Firstly, the introduction of water trading. This enables water rights holders to permanently or temporarily trade their water entitlement to another person without selling their land to. Introducing and strengthening a cap and trade water market enables efficient allocation and reallocation of water among competing users under conditions of scarcity. It enables water users to make decisions about the value of water based on their intended uses, and it enables government to use trade to achieve environmental objectives to the benefit of willing sellers. Overall, while there are still improvements that can be made to Australian water markets, these have enabled water to be reallocated from less productive to more productive uses and have facilitated return of water to the environment in over-allocated systems. The second reform I'll mention today is cost-reflective pricing. This has been used to identify appropriate levels of investment in infrastructure and service provision. Through use of independent regulation, it ensures prices reflect the full economic, social and environmental costs of water provision. It facilitates transparent decision making and reduces the risk of political interference in price setting processes, and it enables consistent and improved planning for water infrastructure and services. It's enabled high levels of service with very low water losses in Australia in comparison with many other countries. How have these reforms to enhance water resilience contributed to economic resilience? Let's turn to one metric now. Obviously, measuring economic resilience is challenging and nuanced. Given time constraints today, allow me to take one simple measure, the gross value of irrigated agricultural production. I've already spoken about water trading in the Murray-Darling. This is a key driver for economic resilience in the basin as it helps to reduce the economic impacts of drought and manage the risks of climate change. Markets enable agricultural producers and other industries to flexibly meet their water requirements and balance risks and returns. This was seen during the millennium drought where water trading was highly effective in reducing the economic costs of drought for the agricultural sector with the gross value of irrigated ag production in the basin falling by only around 14% between 0506 and 0708, while water use fell by 57%. This was achieved by a move away from annual crops toward high value permanent plantings like fruit and nuts at a time when there was nowhere near enough water to meet all demands. The functioning of water markets has also been tested more recently during a period of drought between 2017 and 2019. Many areas of the country experienced high temperatures and rainfall that was well below average. In 2019-20, the area of summer crops planted in one state was 79% less than in 2018-19. The area planted to cotton fell by 83% in response to high water prices. However, once the drought broke in 2020-2021, there was a significant increase in production of annual crops as water availability recovered. 
In 2021-22, the area planted to cotton in that state increased dramatically again. This demonstrates the market's effectiveness in driving responsive agricultural practices and economic resilience by enabling reallocation of water to higher value uses through a reduction in water used for lower value annual crops. In summary, water management in the Murray-Darling Basin has yielded several key lessons for water resilience and economic resilience, shown here. The experiences and lessons learned from water management in the Murray-Darling Basin since the Millennium Drought have reshaped policies and practices. These lessons are crucial as the region con continues to navigate the complex challenges of water resource management. For more detail on this Australian case study and on the lessons that can be derived from it, please do download the AGWA report when it is launched. Thanks for your time today. And we're really grateful to the Australian Water Partnership and, and uh, uh, Hugh Poehler uh, for that. Uh, it's very interesting to consider, especially in, in such close proximity to the uh, example from China, uh, to take instead of a planning first approach, a market driven uh, uh, approach uh, uh, in terms of thinking about resilience, um, in terms of uh, 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 a broad economic strategies, uh, I think shows some of the uh, alternative models that we might need to be exploring on a global basis. Um, uh, now we'll shift uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Asia Pacific region, uh, at least the East Asia Pacific region, uh, to uh, Jordan in the Levant. Uh, and we'll have Armin uh, uh, Margan uh, uh, speak. He's the team leader for uh, the GIZ project desalinization of sea in brackish water in Jordan. Um, his work uh, has also included uh, projects that improve groundwater resources management uh, for Germany's uh, Federal Institute for Geosciences and Natural Resources. GIZ has a very long-standing uh, commitment uh, in Jordan and has done fantastic work over decades there. And uh, we're really honored to have you, Armin. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Uh, very uh, welcome from uh, Jordan. I will talk to you, uh, take you through the preparation of the third National Water Master Plan and how this may help to increase uh, resilience. Um, the Water Master Plan uh, is and was developed over the past four and a half years and will take another uh, one year about. Uh, first, what is the Water Master Plan? What uh, is the uh, future water demand? Uh, how is the status of conventional water resources? What are the effects of climate change that we can expect? And what are the consequences for planning of all the above? Uh, which projects uh, are uh, um, in the discussion uh, to ensure the continued water supply security and which elements uh, uh, would build uh, uh, for an, an increased uh, water resilience uh, in the sector. Uh, we had two master plans in the past uh, in 1977 and 2004. This one will end in 2024. Uh, a water master plan is a, uh, an instrument uh, to assess the current uh, water situation uh, and uh, to reflect uh, on the expected future situation and to see what kind of gaps uh, we need to expect. It reviews the available resources uh, situation, a conventional and non-conventional. Uh, it looks at the key influencing factors like uh, energy, water quality, climate change. Um, it looks at demand, allocation, and balance. Uh, and then it looks also, of course, at the available infrastructure for water supply and wastewater and how this will change over time. It, in effect, leads to an updated uh, capital investment plan. There are many elements uh, of this water master plan that are uh, uh, subject to rapid change over time. That is especially the water quantity because of uh, continued uh, overuse of groundwater and uh, sedimentation, for instance, in dams. Uh, we have a strong decline in conventional water resources, um, which is not considered uh, in previous uh, project planning. We have a strong effect uh, uh, in terms of climate change impact, minus 15% in surface and groundwater. And this was not considered also in the past uh, in uh, project planning and uh, master planning. 
it's the first time that this is integrated now in the process. Um, what we are also seeing is a slow uh, uh, um, process that uh, is just becoming recognized. Uh, there's changes in water quality, and especially in, with regards to salinity, heavy metals, radioactivity even, which affects not only human health, but also the network itself, and which means a higher cost for treatment in the future. Uh, those are the elements of the current water master plan that we are preparing. Green is ready, blue uh, will be ready soon. Uh, so a large part of the uh, uh, eight volumes is already ready. Uh, and uh, these are the supporting studies that we prepared, many of these topics for the first time ever. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the National Hydraulic Network Analysis. I will leave this uh, um, uh, PDF uh, with you later on, so you can look at the details. Uh, the main conclusions that we already drew in 2020 from the rapid assessment, the mini master plan that we prepared in the beginning is there is a, a strong decline in natural uh, resources, conventional water resources, that is not considered in planning, and it's about minus 40 percent until 2040. Um, while we at the same time, we have a continued increase in demand, uh, which lead to plus 30% in uh, 2040. So the overall gap is 65%. Um, uh, due to the uh, decline in resources, um, well fields and uh, dams, production of, from dams, uh, the existing water supply infrastructure will be obsolete in many areas. It needs to be replanned. Uh, the only means to maintain water supply security at a certain level is designation uh, of brackets and seawater. Here you see this translated into graphics. Uh, this is the uh, conventional uh, water resources, surface and groundwater. These are the projects that uh, are or will be in implementation. Uh, this is the demand. So you can see this gap between demand and supply 65% uh, and brackish water uh, desalination could bridge uh, this uh, current demand that we are uh, visibly seeing um, uh, over the past uh, few years already uh, and it will last until the implementation of this large uh, seawater desalination project Akaba Aman which I will present later. Um, Concerning the groundwater situation, we see a decline between 2018 and 2040 of around five meters per year on average, but up to 10 meters and more in the northern part of the country, which is leading uh, to many wells, which are currently being exploited uh, to fall dry uh, in the uh, western part of the country. And it will also lead to mobilization of brackish water towards the western part of the country, so to the exploited, currently exploited areas. And this we can already see in many well fields happening. The average loss in saturation will be around 100 meters. And that will also lead to higher costs for pumping, for about 40% more. Regarding surface water, we have around 14 dams, uh, of which six uh, of these we investigated. Uh, the total storage capacity is 280 million cubic meters, but 25% of this is already lost to cement, and this makes it uh, difficult to operate dams in many cases. Climate change. Uh, the effect is, uh, as I mentioned, minus 15% uh, for groundwater recharge and minus 15% for surface water runoff. Uh, and this is leading to a, a decreased, uh, reduced water resources availability by 2040 of only 46 cubic meter per capita in here. Two main projects are in the making. Uh, and this one that I'm showing first is very unlikely to happen under the current conditions in Gaza. Uh, that is the Prosperity Blue Line, uh, um, a project where 200 million cubic meters desalinated in Israel would be uh, transferred uh, to Jordan and uh, 
made available in the northern part of the country. Um, while the second project, uh, which would generate 300 million cubic meters uh, in the uh, uh, Red Sea area, would bring uh, desalinated water to the central and northern part of the country, um, 450 kilometers of uh, conveyance. And the uh, conveyance structure which is needed uh, in the in those areas where it would be distributed is not even planned at the moment. This project is currently in the tender, end of the tendering process. So with regards to water supply projects, we are facing the problem that uh, these projects need a long time for cooperation, five to 10 years. Uh, the outcome of the tendering is very uncertain because a very large financial volume is in, uh, involved here. Um, some of these projects, like the mentioned Prosperity Blue Line, are politically diffic uh, difficult to be implemented because they require regional cooperation. And uh, one thing that is very typical here, cost is not really considered uh, yet to a large extent. Um, but the cost of desalination uh, would be fairly high in the future, less so for the Prosperity Blue Line than for the Akaba Aman project. Um, what are the elements uh, that uh, we hope would build resilience in the water sector? Um, one thing, the master plan helped to raise awareness about many facts uh, which risk uh, uh, which cause a risk for water supply security, like uh, um, the climate change or the water resources decline. It, this, the list has brought about a rethinking of the capital uh, investment planning process that is required. And uh, there is no way around the desalination. Uh, it's become inevitable, although it requires a high capital investment and operational cost. Um, another fact is that uh, if we bring more uh, desalinated water to the main demand centers in the future, this would also mean the more treated wastewater uh, reuse available in the uh, uh, lowlands in the Jordan River. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Armin. And uh, if I could take away one one point from your talk, I'd say that this is a race for Jordan. It's a, uh, and, a and they... very dramatic race. Um, uh, it all depends now on the uh, feasibility of this one project. Exactly. Yes, it's a it's a quite quite dramatic. Um, I'm going to turn now uh, to uh, the panel. Uh, we have. Uh, some excellent uh, uh, members of the panel. Uh, the moderator is Marie-Laure Vercambra, uh, the executive director for the French Water Partnership. Um, she's uh, uh, previously led the Water for Life and Peace program at Green Cross International and ex has expertise in issues concerning development governance and management of cross-border river basins and human rights. Uh, we'll also be joined by uh, Raul Munoz Castillo, environmental engineer with over 18 years in environmental water resources management. He specializes in water infrastructure and policy, currently leading the Inter-American Development Bank's regional initiatives like the Water Energy Food Nexus in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Water Funds Program, and the Water Security Strategy. Carter Brandon is a senior fellow at uh, World Resources Institute, WRI, working on the economics and finance of climate change adaptation. Prior to WRI, Carter had a 24-year uh, career at the World Bank, uh, culminating as global lead economist uh, for the Environment, Natural Resources, and Climate Change Departments. Diego Rodriguez uh, is lead water economist for Eastern and Southern Africa with the World Bank, where he's responsible for analytical work on climate change, resilience, and urban water security. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience in economic analysis of projects. Uh, uh, Petra uh, Hel Hel uh, Helgers is a professor and chair of the Water Resources Management Group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. She has extensive experience in the economic analysis of water allocation issues uh, and the role of economic instruments uh, in agriculture. Uh, over to you, Marie Lor. Thank you, John, and um, hello to all. I'm very pleased to be here today as well. 
so this uh, panel discussion is going to address the following question. How do we understand resilience um, as an economic concept? And I'm going to ask a first question to um, Raul um, Munoz Castillo. Um, so, uh, Mr. Castillo, how do you, um, how do we build a national capacity and awareness for resilience and the role of water to ensure that resilience is coherent and effective? Do you have any thoughts on this? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, my lord. Sorry, I'm on, I'm on mission right now, so I have to attend this uh, with the phone. Actually, I'm close to start a meeting here, but no, thank you for the opportunity. So I, I don't want to repeat some of the concepts that some of the <clears throat> colleagues have mentioned before, but in Latin America, actually, we are we are trying to, to push this contest that we have in which basically, um, as the colleague from Australia said, droughts, for instance, and, 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 and driving a positive uh, um, impact in terms of change. So Chile, for instance, is under this, this mega sequia, losing around 100% of the GDP annually. So it's a huge impact. The COVID-19 has been uh, impacting several the Andean uh, <clears throat> sub-region, the Amazon region. So raising the importance of having water resilience as a driver of um, socioeconomic um, development and stability. So we started the um, the, the initiative of um, water security a few years ago, and we are trying to do our best in order to, to uh, uh, highlight the, the importance of water resilience as a driver of socioeconomic uh, um, resilience too. So um, some of the efforts we are doing um, in general terms where we are moving forward from uh, what we were working like 15 years ago in terms of uh, water infra investments to water resilient and, and sustainable development um, oriented investments. So if we take a uh, um, loan profile approved by the board at the IDB 15 years ago, was basically uh, focusing on services, access to services and some institutional capacity in the sector. And now we have cross sector and climate oriented components with a specific investments on green infra solutions and based on um, analytical tools and, and, and vulnerability, vulnerability analysis to uh, mainstream invert climate change impacts into investments. So a clear example now is a drainage investment within the bank, which uh, used to be like a, a business, <laughs> like a like old fashioned kind of investment, and, and now it's mostly uh, supported by uh, green infrastructure. So, so we are trying to mainstream better uh, the water energy food nexus into policy at national level, but also and to, into investment design. Needing to, so this is needed to bring the value of water into decision making. So not only about water energy food, uh, or, and, and, sorry, <clears throat> water energy food and sector, but also including urban development and health. So and having the the, the, the environment as a, another key economic actor. So improving the understanding of the value of water to inform policy and, and investment planning beyond um, classical ROI based or socioeconomic financial analysis, which are we are working more in terms as a, as a safeguard financial um, uh, measure. So to make um, to make sure that the project that the project was uh, financial uh, financially feasible. So specifically in having or investing in a better understanding of the value of hydroeconomic system services and natural capital. So with that, we, we are trying to speed up implementation of MBS as a key driver of resilience. For instance, we have the water funds program with 25 pro, um, water uh, fund uh, created um, over the region. So this is a magnificent laboratory to uh, pilot science and technology to scale up these kind of solutions into investments have better understanding of climate change impacts in water and water dependent sectors. So we, are, we want to understand the cause of no action um, or maladaptation practices into both services and also cross-sector economic development. So we made an assessment and we have some publications with integrated model assessment um, back in 2015 uh, to assess uh, what would be the impacts in terms of water uh, um, if all the countries in the region were implementing uh, their um, SDGs and Paris Agreement commitments uh, uh, considering climate change scenarios. Um, we saw that um, it has a, a, a cost at all in terms of water um, uh, demand. Um, with that associated, we, the region will need to invest 25 American million dollars in the next five, 10 years to, to ensure um, 
water, energy, and food uh, uh, pro production, and around 20, uh, 55 billion dollars by 2050. So we have to um, plan for some time for uh, the other speakers as well. So I was wondering um, if you could conclude on your comments. Yeah. Sure. No. So we are we are developing water security planning with a specific uh, vulnerability assessment, growth and uh, growth and flood management plans, and best practices and um, MBS into into investments. We are supporting Chile with their national um, security water security plan with a specific pilot and uh, uh, water security plans into basins. Working more in um, upstream planning, understanding the, the regional. Uh, national and local dynamics into, into planning, so including trade and integration. So, and we're scaling up our um, say water resilient solutions and, and at regional level via promoting transboundary cooperation. Um, um, basically, um, working with countries also to include water resilient, um, water resilient at policy level, investment level, with the commitment of having 100% of our portfolio aligned with the Paris Agreement, both for mitigation and adaptation. Something, a few things more to, to, to tell, but uh, I think uh, we need more time for the rest of the panelists. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much for this insight. Um, I would like now to turn to, uh, to Carter. Uh, Carter, you are not a water person. Uh, you are a climate change economist, um, we can say, right? And uh, so we are really eager to hear what you have to say about um, water resources, um, because we, all our water people. And um, what would you answer to this question? Should water resources have a privileged role in climate policy, in adaptation planning? Or uh, in other words, do, you, do we need to think about water in different ways than other natural resources, like forests, for instance? Okay, great. Uh, before I jump in, it's 11.29 here in DC. John, do you want to jump in at all and make a comment about timing because this we're, is we're, official yeah we'll we'll run a little bit longer uh, uh apologies that some of the earlier talks uh ran longer than than planned so if if uh if, if, if people can stay longer that would be gratefully received great um thanks so let me jump right in uh you're right i, I enjoyed meeting all uh, hearing all these um, presentations from water specialists i'm not my uh, uh, work is very much with the ministries of finance. So if I can comment, it's from the broader objective of ministries of finance, essentially allocating budget and managing risk. So I have three points. So I'll try to be quick. The first point is what is risk? And for a minister of finance, yes, they understand drought, they understand floods, but they don't really understand or care about floods or droughts. What do they, uh, uh, floods or, uh, droughts or floods, what do they care about? They care about how this impacts the economy, which gets to the title of this whole session, macroeconomic policy and water resilience. How can it help us? So what does it do for growth? What does it do for jobs? What does it do for trade? When it comes to trade, that affects revenues and tariffs. How does that affect exchange rates? How does it affect debt? And how does it affect um, uh, financial sector stability, particularly when there's a lot of credit markets in the agricultural sector that depend on the water. So that's the parameters that the Ministry of Finance. Now, second, second question, is there underinvestment in water to address risk in the economy? Absolutely. Is the link between water as a benefit that we've known for decades for health, for agriculture, for industry, for growth? Those realities are still there, and climate makes it worse. We know that. But there's underinvestment in every sector. Everybody, if you look at the SDGs and the scientific review of SDGs that came out this summer, zero of 17 are on track. Zero of 17 are on track to be completed even by 2050. They were designed to be completed by 2030. So there's underinvestment everywhere. So is water different? Yes and no. Why is it different? And this is my third point. If we value the benefits of investing in water and we go beyond the water sector and we look at all the co-benefits, which are in nature and in health and reducing costs and reducing the cost of investment and reducing the cost of insurance, things like that. We've done empir empirical analysis 
the benefits of investing in water across climate avoided, avoided risk and the development side are much larger than usually assumed if you look only from a climate point of view or look only from a development point of view and the total benefits are much larger and that case needs to come out. That story needs to come out. Um, basically, I think that's my basic point. The, the final comment I'd like to make, uh, part of the title of this thing was the dismal science. By the way, the reason economics is called dismal science has nothing to do with um, uh, Malthus and starvation, by the way, which is what most people think. Economics has to do, the reason it's called dismal is because economists in the early 19, uh, 1800s argued against slavery. And slavery was assumed in England to be essential to prosperity. And an economist said, no, free labor markets are better than slavery. And so they were called the dismal science. So I'd like to just put in that plug that economics can help by valuing the benefits, by doing the modeling, by showing risk reduction. It can really help with ministries of finance. Thanks. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll uh, now turn to uh, to Diego. Um, so Diego Rodriguez uh, from the World Bank, you have played a critical role in uh, in, in uh, developing a number of um, climate change development reports for the World Bank. Um, one question: uh, Can you provide some examples of how water plays? a uh, strategic role in this uh, development reports, please, climate change. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Marie-Laure, and again, thanks for the <clears throat> invitation. Um, yeah, I, I think I was listening to some of what um, uh, Carter was mentioning on the on this notion of having the, um, you know, you have a, a water as a critical role for development, the water as a critical role role within the climate uh, discussions uh, and in the in the climate change development reports that we've been preparing we try to <clears throat> incorporate all of those aspects into one uh, set of clear objectives that you want to accomplish so it's not a, a climate change analysis per se it's not a development analysis per se but it's a it, it's a it's a product that incorporates and and brings all of those uh, different economic sectors, the, the, you know, the deep dives on individual economic sectors, but also looks at um, uh, how those economic factors, uh, sectors may affect uh, growth, development, the issue of job, job creation, uh, issues of uh, how it may affect uh, the tax base and fiscal, uh, fiscal impacts at the macro level. Uh, and and it's an attempt to look also very much on the um, on the environment side at issues of <clears throat> the importance of social capital, for example, and uh, the importance also of um, social uh, and distributional effects. Um, I think that one one of the critical aspects that we have seen is that when you start looking at uh, uh, purely the the macroeconomics uh, the macroeconomic analysis that has been done which in some cases looks primarily at the impact of um, climate change, how those affect <clears throat> different productive uh, activities and how in, that in turn may affect uh, growth. Or in some cases where we use macro models that are more uh, uh, related to, to fiscal effects of different policies. Um, one thing that, that we, we, we've been seeing is that a lot of the analysis that has been done on how to build resilience of the economic sectors has been quite challenging to bring those results into the macroeconomic discussions. You know? So uh, you see, for example, the, the, the effect that you have uh, if you build resilience of the water systems and you try to quantify what are the the the, res, the the resilience or the investments that are required to build resilience of the water systems, but then translating that at the at the fiscal and the growth um, impacts has been quite challenging and and in a sense also a learning experience from from uh, both the sector level so the water specialist or the agricultural specialist and also on the on the macro side from the macroeconomists on how you can 
integrate those things and, and also uh, complement some of the nuances that you can get from the from the growth uh, models. So, for example, one of the issues that we had in the CCDR and the Climate Change Development Report here in South Africa was that when we tried to look at the economic impacts of the lack of investments in flood protection in South Africa, those impacts were extremely low in terms of economic growth, right? So the, you, you were talking about one or two percent of GDP that was uh, the effect on on the on the on the stock, you know, the shock uh, to the economy. But then on the regional side, those impacts were much larger. So in the area in which the flood uh, uh, impacted uh, the region, that was the area of Durban, then all of a sudden you had massive uh, other type of um, economic costs that were not properly incorporated in the macro uh, models. So for example. Uh, oil from the port was not able to be uh, transported to the airport. The airport had to stop basically the international airport in Johannesburg, operation for several days, industries that could not operate because there was no access to the facilities, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the low income population that were unable to go to work. And, and, and all of those sort of um, costs were not properly incorporated. And at the same time, the, the, this type of analysis give us a very good uh, um, opportunity to look at sort of the, the co-benefits and the relationship with other sectors. So that's when we start working and saying, you know, there are other co-benefits that you can incorporate when you do uh, the analysis within uh, discrete economic sectors. And if you want to build, to build um, sustainability and promote development, you have to ensure that the synergies and the trade-offs across those sectors is clearly identified, right? And that they, you can provide the, the, the necessary tools and the necessary um, uh, ana analytical framework. So that could be translated in the macro and fiscal uh, effects analysis. So I'll, I'll stop there, Marie-Laure, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to Petra Heleger. Um, Petra, you're a water resources economist and a professor with a strong interest in food system res resilience. Um, you're going to get the conflicts question. Um, <laughs> the very easy one. Um, can we avoid conflicts between agriculture and cities, energy ecosystems, etc., cetera, um, as climate keeps evolving? Well, I, I like the idea of using water uh, as a medium for resilience among sectors a lot, I have to say, to absorb shocks. But that has implications eh, for, for agriculture, and especially for the production of stable foods, which are often considered as low-value foods. Whereas I, I really think that should be reassessed because, like Carter also said, financially it's maybe low value, but socioeconomically it might have a high value because it also makes countries independent, for instance, if you are food self-sufficient, but it also can create stability. So I, I think this whole notion of low value, of, of that water has a low value for the production of uh, stable crops, should be reassessed because I think it has a, a socioeconomically higher value. Um, I think there are limitations, of course, for agriculture uh, to absorb shocks. I think uh, the agriculture sector also eventually has to uh, make adaptations because now there's really production optimization. And I think in the long run, that's not possible any longer because of climate change. So instead of maximizing your agriculture production, you could also think about stabilizing uh, agriculture production so that you have stable uh, yields, not at maximum yield, but at a lower level, but more stable instead of high, highly variable in the future. And I think uh, apart from the agriculture production sector, also in the, in the food systems, there are many possibilities to absorb shocks, eh? by larger stocks, etc. So I think uh, yeah, various levels where you can still absorb stocks, uh, adapt uh, the agriculture production sector or the food system as such. So conflicts, yeah, there's, there's fierce competition, that, that's for sure. Eh? Um, 
yeah, eventually, uh, well, food security is important to all. Eh? I mean, especially to the vulnerable countries, we highly depend on food imports. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a social objective, I think, for, for the world as well, which should be, I think, evaluated also in the value of water for food production. Thank you. We're running out of time. I, I wish uh, we could continue with uh, the four of you. Um, but um, over to you, John. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, marie Laura, and to the panelists. We're really grateful for your time uh, and, uh, and your uh, wisdom and insights. Um, um, might be uh, useful if you uh, put your uh, email addresses into the into the chat if uh, others would like to follow up uh, with, with you um, offline. I suspect that there will be uh, uh, interest in engaging with you. Um, Alex, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I want to give a couple of quick announcements before uh, we sign off. Um, next year, we're planning a series of uh, four webinars. These are the working titles and, and uh, approximate dates. Uh, we've actually started to touch on some of these issues already. Uh, 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 first, looking at the in insurance uh, sector, uh, is there are there ways that we can really begin to think about systemic risk and resilience uh, through insurance? Um, especially uh, through the commercial insurance sector. Uh, banking, again, um, uh, kind of a public-private uh, uh, sector. Uh, can we strengthen resilience through uh, finance and funding processes? Um, credit ratings, uh, are, are there ways in which we can incentivize water resilience? There's some early experiments uh, that have been occurring at a number of the rating agencies, for instance, in, in this space. Uh, that we've had some interesting discussions around. And uh, lastly, following up on actually one of the points that came up in uh, the Q&A, um, looking at macroeconomic projections, um, are, are we actually seeing the range of climate futures uh, that we may be exposed to? Uh, and and I think getting to some uh, exactly of the issues that, uh, uh, that our panelists were describing, the kind of multifaceted uh, uh, trade-offs uh, that we need to make uh, around a uh, trade, uh, uh, around um, energy versus agriculture, uh, around what uh, growth and prosperity look like. Um, so uh, you can uh, sign up uh, for our mailing list for our uh, uh, to to get uh, notices about the uh, report that that's coming out um, in our LinkedIn group. Uh, if you follow the link there. Next slide, Alex. And um, I just want to uh, thank all the speakers uh, that that were uh, uh, with us today. Uh, I'm really grateful on behalf of myself and Niels Flanderen uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for participating, for joining, uh, and please stay in touch. We uh, want to make this the, the start of a conversation, not the end of it. Thank you.